I'm Mark Golub. And in the news, of course, reaction to the historic address by Prime Minister Netanyahu to a joint session of Congress in which Mr. Netanyahu laid out in strikingly clear fashion the threats posed by a nuclear Iran and why the anticipated deal which the administration seems on the verge of making with Iran is, to use Mr. Netanyahu's words, not a bad deal, but a very bad deal. After going through a rather detailed history of Iran sponsoring terrorism and death throughout the world, showing how it's the same kind of Islamic fundamentalism that drives ISIS, threatening Western civilization everywhere, the Israeli Prime Minister outlined his objections to the administration plan. One, that it would leave Iran's nuclear infrastructure in place. Two, that it gradually removed sanctions without exacting anything in return from Iran. And three, that the plan's sunset provision guarantees that within 10 years, Iran will have international legitimacy to become a nuclear weapons state with intercontinental missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons virtually anywhere on the globe. The Prime Minister practically begged Congress, and by extension the American administration, to predicate any deal with Iran on Iran's changing its policies, to stop supporting terror in the Middle East, to stop exporting terror around the globe, and to stop promising to annihilate the one and only Jewish state of Israel, a line which evoked wild applause and whistling throughout the Congressional Hall. In a statement released by the White House, the president responded to Mr. Netanyahu's appearance by saying the prime minister offered, quote, no viable alternatives, unquote. And Nancy Pelosi was said to have been near tears over what she labeled the prime minister's being condescending to Congress by warning them not to make major concessions in any nuclear agreement with Iran. As always is the case, people often see things from their own perspective and don't necessarily agree with each other. I've heard some Israelis say they thought Mr. Netanyahu would offer brand new reasons to oppose the impending deal, and they were critical that he did not do so. While I tend to agree with those who argue, there's nothing new to be said about the deal, and that the contribution Mr. Netanyahu made with his speech, was to present the dangers inherent in the impending deal in the most systematic, comprehensive, and intelligible fashion done to date. And I find it very hard objectively to disagree with the realities of Iran, which Mr. Netanyahu categorized, or to disagree with his fundamental premise that Iran cannot be trusted and that the world has an obligation to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weaponized state, not for a period of up to 10 years, but for the indefinite future, unless and until Iran changes its ways, its sponsoring worldwide terrorism, gives up its goal of ruling the world as an Islamic religious state, and no longer desires the annihilation of Israel. Until then, the Western world should ensure that Iran does not have the ability to reach a nuclear weapons threshold. But not everyone agrees. And we thought it would be interesting to hear an Israeli perspective. And so for some commentary, we're pleased to be joined on our JBS phones now by Nathan Gutman, the Washington Bureau Chief of IBA News in Israel, which you see every evening here on JBS. And Nathan Gutman also writes for the Jewish Forward. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. So, Nathan, first of all, you were in Washington. By any chance, were you actually in the hall when Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke? Yes, I, I was in Congress to, to hear Netanyahu's speech and to gather reactions uh, um, to the speech afterwards. Okay. So, Nathan, you're a, are you a, a sopper? Were you born in Israel? No, but I grew up in Israel. I spent most of my life in Israel. Okay. So you can bring a perspective most American Jews just don't have. I'm curious to know, I've asked many people today, Nathan, 
how they reacted. They were in the hall. Many Jewish leaders were in the hall, American Jewish leaders. I'm asking you a similar question, but from an Israeli perspective, how did you experience the event emotionally? And, you know, how did you judge the reaction you, you heard or saw coming back from Congress? Well, I think one thing to keep in mind uh, is that for Israelis, and I was covering it as a reporter, but for, for Israelis watching it uh, and that are not involved in it, I think there's something about the setting there that is very impressive and very different uh, um, compared to what uh, we're used to back at home. Um, there is a sense of awe to a certain extent when you enter Congress, sit there in a joint uh, meeting of the, both chambers, when you hear the greetings, when you see the standing ovation, yes. definitely, if, if Netanyahu had in mind Israeli viewers and Israeli voters um, when he decided to, to um, uh, accept uh, Speaker Boehner's invitation, I'm sure this was part of it, because it is something that, I'm, uh, that I know also comes across on the TV broadcast uh, and, and in reports from here. It's very different. It does give a sense that the Israeli leader is accepted in one of the, the, the most prestigious forums in the world. Yes. By the way, Nathan, he is. I mean, I, I believe there was a genuine embrace of the prime minister. This is the, the, the everybody knows it's the third time he's addressed Congress, but he addressed Congress in 2011, received a fabulous reception, and he seems to have received a fabulous reception again today. Again, you're in the hall. I'm watching on television. But it seemed to me, Nathan, that Congress, both sides of the aisle, both the Republicans and the Democrats, really sort of were happy to hear him and happy to be there and, and at times gave him a bipartisan, rousing uh, standing ovation. That's my sense. Is it what you saw and heard yourself? Well, to a certain extent, yes, I, I agree with that, Mark. And we should keep in mind also that Netanyahu, according to his advisors, made changes until the last moment in his speech because um, he got this uh, um, uh, a message from Democrats that uh, um, they'd be happy to be there and to listen, but they don't want to be embarrassed by any kind of um, uh, political or partisan applause line. So uh, Netanyahu did make sure in his speech that he doesn't say anything that would come across as being too partisan yes. or as a personal attack on President Obama, which made life easier for Democrats. Yes. By the way, I also thought that was politically astute of him. And there was, by the way, he was very complimentary of the president at the beginning of the speech. I don't know how much it really meant to President Obama, whether you know, President Obama is listening to this either firsthand or secondhand and saying, yeah, 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 or whether, you know, it was an appropriate and therefore a meaningful diplomatic gesture. What do you guess? Well, I think, first of all, it was a way of, of disarming a lot of the criticism in, that was hurled at Netanyahu because of the, uh, of, of the speech. Many people said it would be highly political. So Netanyahu um, went out of his way to make sure that it's not. And in that sense, I think it was important for Democrats. It didn't change much in the White House, uh, in, at least based on the official reactions that we've been seeing in the last few hours. Uh, the president uh, said he, that he didn't watch the speech. He read the transcript. He didn't hear anything new there. Um, other White House sources said that Netanyahu didn't offer any alternative. But I think for, for some members of, of, uh, of Congress, it did make the whole speech more palatable. Yes. So, uh, I, I've heard different things from different, different people on the Hill. No doubt that Republicans were enthusiastic about the speech. They thought it was well delivered. They thought he made a very strong and valid point there. And they thought it might actually lead some kind of, to some kind of change regarding uh, um, the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. Democrats were split. Some of them liked it, some of them didn't. Some of them, uh, I spoke to, to Congressman Nadler in the hallway. He said that he, he liked the speech, but he still felt uncomfortable with the delivery and, and with the, um, the, this the storm surrounding it. And, of course, there, was a, there were those 60 Democrats that didn't show up, that boycotted the, the speech. Um, they, uh, some of them held a, a press conference later on in front of a, a packed room with the reporters, and they definitely weren't pleased uh, with the speech. So, so, yeah, you hear different reactions. Okay. What have you either heard or what, have, what do you sense the Israeli response to be? You know, if I were watching this 
if I were watching this event, this historic event in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Ranana, and I was watching it as an Israeli, and we're told, Nathan, that Israelis tend to be very cynical. You know, that, that many people were criticizing uh, Mr. Netanyahu because they thought he did this as a political grandstand just weeks before the Israeli election. What's your sense of how it played on the Israeli scene? I would guess that, uh, um, uh, first of all, maybe we should say that I don't think there was anything there that Israelis didn't know or didn't hear before. Israelis are aware of, well of uh, um, the shortfalls that Netanyahu sees in this uh, uh, emerging, de emerging deal with uh, Iran. Um, Israelis are highly skeptical, skeptical about the prospect of actually reaching a, a good deal with Iran. So in that sense, I think even critics of Netanyahu don't really, um, uh, 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 we don't usually hear much criticism uh, uh, from them regarding the details of what he had to say, regarding um, uh, uh, his uh, suspicious approach towards this uh, deal. On the other hand, um, I'm sure if we ask Israelis, they'll be split along party lines. Uh, um, supporters of Netanyahu will think that he did a great job, and we see that already in the reactions in the Israeli press and, and uh, things that you read online. So definitely they think that he did a great job, that it was worthwhile coming here despite uh, the controversy and delivering this speech. And critics of Netanyahu um, will, will point to, to, to the fraught relationship with uh, President Obama as a sign that uh, maybe it wasn't a good idea. But I don't think anyone uh, in Israel, uh, um, or at least it's, it's not main, uh, part of the mainstream discussion in Israel, um, to criticize Netanyahu's actual uh, um, response to this uh, Iranian deal. I, I, I think on the issue itself, he, ha he probably has more support than on the way that it was delivered. Yes. Uh, you heard my opening comments. and. Yes. For me, it's not about whether he came up with something new. I felt he crafted the entire picture in a way that was very compelling. And I think it's hard to find ways to disagree with him unless you fundamentally believe that Iran can change and that if you make a deal with Iran, it will in some, how, in some way incentivize Iran to change. That is almost a matter of religious conviction more than it is objective intellectual thought and argument. But I felt his contribution was not that he came up with something new, but that the package he presented was very compelling. And I'm wondering whether you, you, know, you think I'm wrong or I'm right in this. Well, first of all, I think that there was, because of all this hype around this speech, and because of the fact that Netanyahu put in so much behind this speech uh, and... and wouldn't listen to, to, to warnings of people saying, well, you know, it's going to mess up relationship with the White House. There was this expectation that in the 30 so or so minutes uh, of, of standing in front of Congress and speaking, he'll deliver something that no one has ever heard before. It'll have some kind of a silver bullet that will um, lead people to say, oh, well, we never heard this before. This is amazing. We cannot go ahead with this deal. And, and we didn't hear that. As you said, he, he packaged it. He explained it. He, he put it all together in a framework that's coherent and makes sense and made the case against the deal, but it wasn't anything no one, uh, people uh, hadn't heard before. Yes. And uh, regarding the, the, the substance of it, uh, I just should, should say the administration does have answers to most of the points raised by Netanyahu. And when you speak to people from the administration, they say, we're not about trusting Iran, we're not going to fall in love with the Ayatollahs. We're setting up a regime of sanctions and monitoring and uh, in, uh, international involvement that will make sure that Iran can have its limited enrichment and at the same time resolve one of the biggest problems the region is facing, which is a, a nuclear Iran just around the corner. All right. Nathan, I can't have you on without, ask, without asking you just a quick moment. Bottom line, what do you expect to happen in the elections of March 17th? Oh, well, I, I, as a reporter, I'm not going to <laughs> go into any betting game here. But I would say what I'm hearing from my Israeli friends is that 
the race is open and it could go either way. It's probably the closest election we've seen for a long time. Okay, then it's an exciting thing for you to watch as a journalist. And we'll be watching IBA to hear what you and IBA has to say. Nathan, I'm very, very appreciative of the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. You be well. Nathan Gutman, the Washington Bureau Chief of IBA News in Israel. We also are thrilled to have on our phones uh, someone you've heard often here on JBS. He's the former president of the Union for Reform Judaism. He is now a superb columnist who writes for Haaretz and Time magazine. It's Eric Yaffe, whom you also can find online. Uh, Eric has his own website. And if you go to ericyaffe.com, you can make sure you read what Eric is uh, writing all the time. He is one of the most insightful individuals on the American Jewish scene. And it's a pleasure to welcome Eric to our, to our program now. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be with you. Eric, you watched the, uh, the speech on television, Netanyahu's speech. First of all, emotionally, how did you react to it? He's an extraordinary speaker. He, he touched me now, as he always does. Nobody can do that the way that he does it. Yes. So the, the speech in and of itself was masterful. Uh-huh. Now, what about substance, Eric? Did, uh, first of all, did you think he persuaded anybody in the congressional hall to be more, what he would call, more hard line on the American administration's impending deal? Or, again, was it a, you know, a wonderful feel-good moment, but it not, did not necessarily have any payoff? I think it's unlikely he convinced anybody. The speech was wonderful. The politics were deeply problematic, meaning uh, his politics both in the last month and, for that matter, over the last five or six years. So um, I, I think that it was perceived by Democrats in the hall as an attack on their president, and therefore uh, very unlikely that they would be moved, even if the arguments were convincing. Interesting. By the way, do you, you know, there have been many people who have said, right or wrong, if one does a cost-benefit analysis, what was worrying many people, many Jews, and Eric, I was down at APAC, there wasn't one Jewish leader I spoke with who was comfortable about the way diplomatically this played itself out. And there was criticism of Boehner, there was criticism of, of Netanyahu, people wished somehow the whole thing had been handled better handled differently. At the same time, many people were arguing that the Prime Minister of Israel, who's been driven, he's been obsessed by this issue, has every right and should have, even has a responsibility to grab any kind of international platform, which speaking to a joint session of Congress provides, to make the case as strongly as possible. But the argument, the cost-benefit analysis was that he may have cost bipartisan support in Congress for Israel by making it more difficult for Democrats to support, if not Israel, then Netanyahu, without seeming to in somehow betray their Democratic president. I want you to speak about this cost-benefit analysis. And you know, if you were in the inner circle, Eric, and you had the chance to have advised Prime Minister Netanyahu before he went public with any acceptance of an invitation, what would you have recommended he do? I would have said do it in a different way. Uh, up till three or four days ago, we could have done it in a different way. How? I would, I would have said cancel the speech, say I'm, I'm sorry that the speech has raised issues of partisanship, so I'm going to put it aside. But I'm going to come to Washington with Bushy Herzog, with my opponent in this election, and not for a speech before Congress, but we're going to ask for a meeting with the leadership of Congress. We're going to ask for a meeting with the President of the United States. We're going to together speak to APAC. And we're going to make it clear this is not an electoral issue for anyone, mm -hmm. that this is a matter for all Israelis. And together we are going to stand up for the security of Israel, which is our you know, most fundamental consideration. If he had done that, um, I think the response would have been overwhelming. I think the, uh, the political issues would have been put aside. I don't think he would have hurt his own electoral chances, by the way. I think he probably would have enhanced them. 
And uh, that's what I would have recommended, and I'm, I'm sorry he didn't consider that. I know it was, you know, proposed and batted around in Israel. Why do you think, if he considered it, he didn't go in that direction? Look, I, 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 I can't get into his head. I mean, obviously a lot of people said that this was an electoral ploy simply to advance his own you know, political interests in a close election. Uh, I would like to believe that the prime minister of the state of Israel uh, is not going to be motivated purely by personal political concerns with dealing with these kinds of issues. Uh, whatever the reasons were, uh, I, I think he undermined his own cause because I'm fundamentally sympathetic Yes, what he's saying about Iran, and I believe it's an existential issue, and therefore I think that you have to put that ahead of all other political concerns. And I don't think he's done. I don't think he did it now. I don't think he's done over the course of the last five or six years either. Okay. And now finish the thought. Do you think in any way bipartisan support for Israel has been fundamentally changed because of this issue. And when I say issue, the flap between, uh, the flap over, does he or does he not accept what seems to clearly have been a partisan invitation from the Republican Speaker of the House. What damage, if any, long term has been done to bipartisan support of Israel? I think it's a blow. And uh, I, I think that immediately, the American Jewish community has to go to work to repair the damage that has been done. I think we need to send a message to Israel that we need to be working on this together and uh, that we can't continue a course which has led to this confrontation and is potentially enormously damaging and changes the whole direction of Israel advocacy over the last half century. Mm -hmm. Dangerous, troublesome, I'd like to believe it can be reversed. Okay. Do you have any similar criticism of either the administration or Eric uh, or a John Boehner and Congress for the process? Do you ever say to yourself, you know, I think Netanyahu should have handled it very differently, and Eric, you just gave an example of that different, a different strategy that you think would have worked much better. Are you also, if, if I put you now as an advisor of the Obama administration, and you could whisper in his ear, would you have wanted him to go in a different direction as well? Look, I, I, I think that, on the one hand, you can't ask the negotiations to be public, because that's not the nature of the negotiations. Um, do I have criticisms potentially? I mean, I don't know what ultimately the deal will be, neither am I an expert. I would hope, for example, I would advise, for example, that he should bring the deal to Congress. That once there is a deal, if there is a deal, it's got to be handled in an open and in public manner. There's got to be a, a vibrant public debate, and uh, he should get the, the support of Congress for whatever it is that he's proposing. Uh, if it happens in that way, then uh, America will be at its best, and we'll debate the issues, uh, and our representatives will, you know, will make an appropriate decision. Okay, but that was not really the question I meant to ask you. We're talking about what seems to be a, a diplomatic affront from Netanyahu to uh, Obama. And you gave an example of how the Iranian issue aside, substance aside, the form could have been different. And I'm asking you whether the form could have been different as well from the Obama side. And it, I say to myself, I wish somebody had said, whispered in Obama's ear, this is no big deal. There's nothing Netanyahu can say that is going to ultimately hurt you or your chances from your perspective of getting the deal you believe is the only good deal, the best deal possible. By the way, Eric, Reuters puts out that on Monday, President Barack Obama gave an interview to Reuters where he argued that a deal that freezes Iran's nuclear program for at least 10 years would be the best available means of keeping Iran from advancing toward a nuclear weapon. So that piece is public. So I'm saying to myself, you know, maybe Israel handled it badly. Maybe Dermer handled it badly. And maybe Boehner had all kinds of ulterior motives. But at the same time, I wish the administration had also said, we don't need to make an issue over this. And I want to know whether, you know, you're sympathetic you to that. Are talking about the substantive issue or the, quote, protocol issue? Protocol issue. Protocol. I think that... Um 
president of the United States, no president of the United States, uh, wants uh, the leader of a foreign government to come without his knowledge and approval to argue against the position that he is about to take uh, on the international stage. Yes. I think that's true for Democrats. I think that's true for Republicans. The Times mentioned today, if after the start of the Iraq War, the Democratic Congress had invited the president of France, who opposed the Iraq War, to address the Congress, the Republicans, you know, would have been up in arms. And by the way, rightly so. Mm -hmm. right, rightly so. Mm -hmm. This is exactly parallel to that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a small issue. Uh, uh, you know, it's not something I think that you simply uh, dismiss as uh, a question of, of, of courtesy. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's more than that. But, I mean, are you asking, am I, uh, have, has the Obama administration made mistakes along the way? Yes. And the critical question, of course, is the substantive question of whether it's going to be the right deal. Do you think it's, it's the right deal? It's not clear it's going to be the right deal. You're not clear. I'm not clear. No, not at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm very concerned about whether the deal that they're going to come up with is going to preserve American interests and assure stability in the area and uh, also be be appropriate uh, for Israel needs. I think there are all kinds of questions about that. Those have been obscured by the mishandling of this, mm -hmm. so that we're not having the substantive debate that we need to be having right now. That's deeply, deeply troubling. And now we need to get back to that debate. But I think we're there now. I think now that the speech has come and gone, and again, you said at the beginning, it moved, he moves you. He's a very, very good speaker. He's a compelling speaker. He, what I said was, it's not that he said anything new on this issue, but the way he framed it, it in its entirety, the way he packaged it was very clear, and you could follow it, and you understood what the issues were in their entirety, perhaps better than I've ever heard it described before. That was the contribution he made. And Eric, it seems to me now, it's, it's, we're capable of doing exactly what you hope we do, having a substantive discussion on the merits and the flaws of this impending deal. Right. And I think the president needs to make sure that that happens. He has to be open to it. And I think the state of Israel and its leaders have to contribute to this process by avoiding any hint of partisanship or confrontational uh, politics and throwing themselves into the substance and acting like allies, which is what they are. Eric, I always find you bring an analysis that is so broad and encompassing and wonderful and clear. You know I keep telling you all the time, I have to have you on JBS all the time. You're doing fabulous work as, now, as you did for the Union for Reform Judaism. You now are doing fabulous work by writing all the time and commenting all the time on some of the most complex, sensitive issues confronting world Jewry. And I appreciate you very, very much and your time here on JBS. I will chase you all the time, Eric. Okay. I'm happy to be with you, Mark, and thanks for the good work. That Thank you, you very, very much. Bye-bye. Right, right. There you have Eric Yaffe, former president of the Union for American, uh, I'm sorry, former president of the Union for Reform Judaism, currently now a, a most distinguished columnist who writes especially for Haaretz and for Time magazine. And again, you can follow Eric's comments by going to ericyaffe.com. You can even sign up and receive his columns by email. My thanks, as always, to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, producers for this edition of In the News, Ron Jacobson and Jan Weiss. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.